Hi, my name is Kay Sackett Fitzgerald, and March is Women's History Month. Fred Moore from Northeast Philadelphia History Network invited me to speak about a Quaker philanthropist named Anna Thomas Jeans. As you can see, the title of my presentation is The Next Needed Thing, The Life and Legacy of Anna Thomas Jeans, 1822 to 1907. Let's get started. Anna and her family lived in tumultuous times. However, there were glimmers of hopes too. There was social and political and economic unrest. There were the Northern industrialists versus the agrarian slaveholding landowner, landowners of the South. There was rampant disease. There was lack of decent housing, sanitation, drinking water, and education. There was dreary and dangerous factory work and work on the plantations. There was child labor. However, there was also a glimmer of hope. There were benevolent philanthropic organizations, often started by religious organizations, a lot of them by Quakers. There was the scientific method which was adopted and there were advances in medicine. There was new technology development from the telegraph to the railroads to industrialized machinery that was used. There were many, many good things as well that were happening. Philadelphia had been settled by the Religious Society of Friends. Members were also called Quakers. They had core values that guide them towards spiritually meaningful life, and they had an inner conviction that there's that of God or the light within all of us. We all seek that inner light, and they challenged the normal way of living. There were Quaker testimonies of simplicity, peace, integrity, community, equality, and stewardship. The Jeans family were members of the Religious Society of Friends, and they were deeply impacted by the schism that occurred in 1827. But what I'd like to uh, remember is that the Quakers often settled the Western frontier before and after the Civil War. They were very pro-primary and secondary education and started a lot of schools. And they overcame a long distrust of higher education and started actually several colleges in the first medical school for women. They also worked for the abolition of slavery and war, the welfare of African Americans and Native Americans. They were involved in prison reform, temperance, um, work with the mentally ill and the rights of women. And Quakers even played a very predominant role in the early, early Seneca Falls uh, Women's Conference that was held. I'll speak about that a little bit more later. Anna's immediate family was comprised of her father, Isaiah Jeans, who was born September 12, 1769 in Abington, which was near Philadelphia. He was a Quaker merchant and owner of coal mines and land, and he was a member of the Weston Jeans Shipping Merchants. Her mother, Anna Thomas, was born, they think, about 1779 somewhere in Delaware County, which would be the equivalent of Delaware County today. The, her family money came from coal mines and railroads. She married Isaac in Philadelphia on January 2nd in 1800. Between them, they had 10 living births. There was Jacob, Joshua, Mary, William, Joseph, Samuel, George, Isaiah, and Levi all who were born before Anna was. Each of these siblings were um, famous in their own right, from being a physician to a merchant to abolitionists to certainly philanthropists. They lived at 208 North Front Street in the Northern Liberty section of Philadelphia. And again, as I mentioned earlier, they were uh, members of the Religious Society of Friends or the Quakers. They became Hicksites who were liberal and attended Green Street meeting after the schism occurred. And there are some stories about that that are in the Quaker records that talk about how uh, frequently and regularly the Jeans family was not only eldered, but uh, spoken with about their beliefs and their behaviors and how they were eventually um, let go from the Orthodox uh, portion of the Quaker uh, religion and became those liberal quick Hicksites. Anna's 
Anna was the 10th child born to Father Isaiah, who was 53, and her mom was 43. She was born at home on April 7th, 1822. Her older living siblings were 22, 20, 18, 16, 13, and 8. In 1823, when Anna was 1, her next oldest sibling, Isaiah, passed away. What you see on the right is a copy of the record of the births of members of the Religious Society of Friends of the North District. That very last line reads, Anna Jeans, 11 month 7, 1822, Isaiah and Anna Jeans, number 208 North Front Street, and it was recorded on the first month, 13, 1825. To give us some perspective on the Jeans family residences, I've used here an 1842 Ellet Philadelphia County map. And Quaker records and census data indicate the family lived between the yellow circle, which is 198 and 208 North Front Street, and the green circle, which is 1019 Arch Street, until approximately 1850. They had proximity to the docks and the wharves, which you can see there on the map. They were also close to downtown Center City, to the Arch Street Ferry, to the Gasworks, and Franklin Square. They were not far at all from dry goods and the mer merchant stores and certainly had availability to get across on the ferry if they so chose over to New Jersey. Unfortunately for the Jeans family, Anna's mom, Anna, died very young. She died at 47 on February 24, 18. 26. She was buried at Arch Street Meeting Burial Ground, which unfortunately today is no longer here. It is part of a newer building that was constructed and a parking lot, though the remains of the people who had been buried there before were reinterred, most likely at Fairhill. Anna's mom, Anna, died of inflammation of the breast or peri pneumonia. Anna was four. Her father was 57. The remaining siblings were 25, 23, 21, 19, 16. Sister Mary, at the time, 21, fulfilled the role of Anna's mother. As you can see, to the right is a copy of the record of the deaths of members of the Religious Society of Friends Philadelphia Monthly Meeting of the North District. The last line highlighted in yellow reads, Anna Jeans, 47 years old, member of Northern District, died from inflammation of the breast. Not much is known of Anna during her early years of growing up. The recollections that I'm about to tell you about are from her distant cousin named Emma Walters. She suggested that Anna could read before she was five. She was very strong-willed. She was indulged by her father and older brothers. And there's a story where Anna was seated on a low stool next to her father, and they were reading the New Testament when she looked up and said, Why, Father, does it mean that Jesus Christ ascended into heaven, flesh and bones and blood and all? I don't believe a word of it. She figured things out for herself, and once formed, her opinion could not easily be swayed. She had a keen sense of humor and a musical laugh. She was tiny in stature and had a peculiarity of eyesight. She loved fairy tales and novels. She read French with ease, and she had some talent as a painter. If you're looking to the left, that's a picture of Front Street below the docks. If you're looking to the right, that would be Ninth and Arch Streets, both places where Anna would have been familiar, likely walked or rode in front um, and driven in a carriage. It is well known that Anna never traveled farther from Philadelphia than Niagara Falls and the White Mountains and she had few acquaintances and lived simply with her family. They dressed plainly and were actively involved in Quaker initiatives of the time. I've organized the next series of slides and titled them Influences and Life-Changing Events. They are organized by year and the age that Anna was when each of the situations occurred. When she was eight, her brother Jacob started and was an original member and eventually president of the American Institute of Homeopathy. I bring that up because in the 30s, there was a great interest 
among the Quakers and others in both the United States and Europe in homeopathy. And at that time, her brother also wrote a book. And so she likely read that book uh, that linked together the homeopathic principles with Western medicine of the time. And Anna and her sister Mary were active members of the Women's Homeopathic Society. They did fundraising, they funded scholarships and buildings. In 1840, at age 18, Sister Mary was involved with the Native American rights. In fact, she advocated for and served on the PYM Indian Affairs Committee to help negotiate the Seneca land rights against Ogden Land Company. In, when Anna was 24, her brother Jacob and two others established what ultimately became known as Hahnemann Hospital. Unfortunately, uh, it is now closed, but over the many years of Hahnemann's ex early existence and even later, the Jeans family uh, funded a lot of uh, buildings and subscriptions for the medical students and all that sort of thing. So they were quite involved in that organization. Between 1848 and 1849, Anna took landscape painting lessons from Paul Weber, who was a German emigre. She painted something called an allegory, which is a painting that she gifted to her father and hung at Stapley Farm. There's a story in the late 1870s where after the farm had been basically abandoned and left in a caretaker, it was vandalized. And when the police came to let Anna know about this, the only thing she was concerned about was whether the painting had been damaged. And when the painting wasn't damaged, she declared it to be the most valuable of the items at the left at the farm and did not choose to press charges. In 1848 or 49, Anna, between 26 and 27 again, may very well have been to the Seneca Falls Convention, which which was held in New York, and it was all focused on women's rights. Quakers were actively involved in the Quaker uh, movement for women's rights early on. I believe that I calculated uh, the distance to... Um, between Seneca Falls and Niagara Falls, which is where she did travel, and it was a very short distance, maybe 10 or 12 miles. It's possible that she may have actually been there, something that I will investigate and continue to investigate. The picture that you'll see on the right-hand side is really a modern-day picture today, and it comes from the Women's Rights National Historical Park, and it tells the story of the first women's rights convention, which was held in Seneca Falls, New York. And a gentleman by the name of Blake Chamberlain uh, made the mural. And from left to right, it's Elizabeth Caddy Stanton, Lucretia Mott, Martha Coffin Wright, Jane Hunt, Mary Ann McClintock, and Frederick Douglass. And this goes to show you that it was an organization and a conference where both blacks and whites, males and females were represented. Here's some food for thought. The Philadelphia Female Anti-Slavery Society was established in 1823. It was established by Quakers and it was Lucretia Mott and James Mott. That's their pictures in the center in the oval. It was basically a group of suffragettes, both black and white women and their male supporters. Harriet Tubman is suspected to have been a member. The lower left picture is Harriet. The one next to her is of William Stills, a free black man who lived in Philadelphia. Harriet certainly worked the underground and she often spent time at William Stills home at 244 South 12th Street, not far from the Jean's home or Preservation Hall. So it was very likely that the Jean's family were actively involved in the anti-slavery society, though I have not yet um, had that document except, documented, except indirectly um, by a woman by the name of Carol Faulkner, who wrote uh, a book about Lucretia Mott and told me that the Jeans family actually lived right down the street from the Motts on Arch and that they knew each other very well. So that's something for me to follow up on. In 1850, Anna was 28. The Fugitive Slave Act became law. On the left-hand side, the newspaper clipping reads, Read and Ponder the Fugitive Slave Law. 
It disregards all the ordinary securities of personal liberty, which tramples on the Constitution and denial of rights. Basically, paraphrased, bounty hunters could come take black or colored Negroes back down south as slaves. This was a huge uproar in the North by both blacks and whites alike. Also in 1850, the Great Philadelphia Fire of July 9th damaged their North Front Street property, along with a lot of other property down near the wharves and the docks. Shortly thereafter, her father Isaiah died August 7th. He was buried in Abington Monthly Meeting. The center photo is a photograph of the Great Fire that was uh had damaged so much of uh, Philadelphia Wharf and Docks. And this was actually uh, noted in international news as well. This is when, since their home was destroyed, siblings Joshua T., Mary, Joseph, and Samuel, plus Anna, all moved to 1019 to 10, 1023 Arch Street. Apparently, one of the younger brothers had already uh, purchased 1019, and so they just added some extra um, houses where they could live. The Quakers, at the same time, in the 50s, established the first female medical college of Pennsylvania. The Jeans family, again, was actively involved in funding buildings and um, uh, professorships, and they provided subscription services, they endowed chairs, and they gave millions of dollars, or thousands of dollars, I should say, over the years. In 1855, when Anna was 33, her sister founded the Philadelphia Home for Destitute and Colored Children. And this home, like many of the other charitable organizations that the Quakers started, focused on teaching the students, whether it was a trade or teaching them to be d domestic help. And they were very concerned about these children who really had no place to go, no place to live. To give some context for where the Jeans family lived, what I did was take a beige-colored 1864 Smedley Atlas of the city of Philadelphia, and I overlaid that on a current map of the city of uh, Philadelphia and then the metropolitan areas surrounding it. And I'm showing you the Jeans properties in relationship to today. So the top right blue dot is Stapley Farm or the Jeans Family Farm. And that's on Central Avenue in Fox Chase, approximately. The magenta uh, middle blue dot would be uh, the Stapley boarding home in Germantown, which is eventually, we'll talk about that. That's where Anna uh, passed the last years of her life. The green lower left dot is the 1019 to 1023 Arch Street uh, homes in Philadelphia. The lower uh, pink uh, circled dot, if you will, blue dot, is 208 Front Street in the Northern Liberties in the consolidated Philadelphia area. Now, just for fun, I, I calculated the distances, say, from Front Street to Arch Street, and it was 1.2 miles or 25-minute walk. From the Arch Street residence to uh, the Jeans Farm, it was 14.1 miles or a three hour and 20 minute walk. From 1019 to 23 Arch Street to the Stapley uh, Boarding Home, or uh, also called the Germantown Boarding Home, that was 10 point miles, 10.0 miles, or two hours and 25 minute walk. I did not take the time to figure out what it would take for a horse and buggy ride or a horse ride to any of these areas for Anna and her family. But I thought that it would help us put into context exactly where they were living during periods of time in their lives. We know that the Civil War was a time of great strife in the United States. Again, it was the Northern Industrialists versus the agrarian slaveholding landowners in the South. The war 
was between 1861 and 65. Anna would have been between 39 and 43 years of age. The Quakers, who believed in peace, equality, and integrity, did not fight in the war. They espoused peace and nonviolent conflict resolution. On the left, you see that there was a letter penned by Quakers to President Lincoln. The report suggests that Lincoln's mother may have had close Quaker friends. And there were discussions that were held between the Quakers and Lincoln where they talked about peace, democracy, personal rights, and liberty and equality, which helped mold Lincoln's position on Emancipation Proclamation and the freeing of all Southern states. Now, neither side thought this war was going to last a very long time. Unfortunately, six days after the war ended, Lincoln was assassinated. And Anna did live to see the election of the first black man to the U.S. Senate. He's in the center there. His name was Hiram R. Revels, and he was there in the Senate from 1870 to 1871. However, as you can see by the right, the KKK started in 1865 and is still in existence. And this organization began in the South virtually the day after the war ended and segregation really never stopped and blacks really didn't get the right to vote or do anything. They did have the Emancipation Proclamation, but black codes, which dictated all aspects of their lives from voting to citizenship, basically morphed into Jim Crow law. Crow laws, and those laws in some form or another actually were throughout the South and caused a lot of grief for everyone. They were somewhat in the North, too. Uh, it continued poverty, the lack of rights for women, blacks, and minority. There continued to be a lack of education, and the list of social ills continued. And the nation was really left as divided as ever although the Quakers to this day continue to work always for peace. This also saw a time of mass migration from the south to the north and the continued effects of industrialization and building up a country that had been ravaged by war. While I was researching the Jeans family, I observed at the Library Company of Philadelphia, that Sister Mary had purchased share number 1166 there. Shares were purchased at the time, um, and it was a subscription service. So I would think that the Jeans family visited fairly regularly there, though I know they had an extensive library at home when I visited uh, Wesley and Hans Living, which was formerly the Stapley um, boarding home where Anna resided. I actually visited the parlor there and saw books with her nameplate in it. I also know that there were 25 boxes of books that were sold and there was another receipt that I found where it listed all the valuable books that went up for auction after Anna T. Jean's passed away. In 1872, there was a significant change in the uh, family's ability and desire to go to Stapley Farm, which her brothers had purchased in 1845. The Newtown Railroad ran through a portion of Stapley Farm, and the family was very upset about this. They actually um, sued the railroad, but it went bankrupt. And ultimately, the siblings left uh, Stapley Farm. They never returned. They simply shrouded all of the furnishings and left it in care of a caretaker. Now, for years, rumors had some had uh, appeared in the area that perhaps at one point the farm was part of the underground. But that, I suppose, is a mystery that may remain unsolved. In 1877, when Anna was 55, her first brother, Jacob, passed away. He's buried at um, 
Laurel Hill Cemetery. Though if you look it up, he is not listed there as among those who are notable. Though that was not uncommon at the time because uh, Quakers did not even have burial um anything to indicate where they were buried. It was just listed on a piece of paper in a plot, though today there are um, markers for many. In 1880, Anna's brother Joshua T. died. She was 58. In 1866, and based on a lot of religion and her studies of religions, Anna published at age 64 a book titled The Sacrificer and the Non-Sacrificer, it is considered um, a book for prosperity and is still able to be published. Now, it has been reprinted several times. Nonetheless, I do know that um, the uh, book is difficult to read. It is all about religion, and it examined the concepts of the formal priesthood, the sacrificers, and the natural community of believers or the non-sacrificers. We would be sacrificers. And she looked at this in the context of Buddhism, Judaism, Hinduism, and Christianity. In 1889, Anna was 67. Her beloved sister Mary passed away. The brothers and sisters are in, buried at Fair Hill Cemetery. Fair Hill Cemetery is not uh, far from a Temple University, and would well be worth a visit to see how it is held um, in high esteem by the community after many years of neglect. It was also during this time that Anna decided not to forget places of worship. And legend says that Anna's coachman, named either Willie or William, drove her around the country in that if you think back to the area of the map where I showed you um, the four circles where they had uh, property and homes and everything, there were also meetings there. And he would point out that meeting homes that were greatly in need of repair. And what Anna did was bequeath money for the upkeep and repair of these homes and the way it's writ written is to aid, the money was to aid in assisting quarterly and monthly meetings and isolated members of restricted means in the repair and construction of meeting homes for friends of that branch of the Society of Friends of which he was a member and who bear testimony to the saving power of obedience to the law of God in the heart. This is an 1855 Barnes map of newly consolidated city of Philadelphia. And in the earlier slide, I mentioned that the railroad had gone through. The highlighted area in yellow there is where I think the railroad may have gone through. It was considered part of the front of their property. If you look closely, the lower blue dot um, on this particular map, it shows J. Jeans and S. Jeans as the owners of the property. Now, originally they had purchased 200 acres, but over the years they had sold pieces of property. Uh, several of you may know um, Burrowholm Park and the Ryers Mansion and others there. So that shows you where uh, the property was that was disputed and part of the reason why the uh, Jeans family never came back to the area and I believe that there are approximately uh, 88 acres that ultimately became Jeans Hospital um, and we're going to talk about that a little bit later. I titled this slide Death Doth Us part, a tongue twister for sure. But the 1890s were a time of tremendous change for Anna. In 1894, her last two siblings, brothers Joseph and Samuel, died. They died within a month of each other. Now, Joshua, Mary, Samuel, and Joseph are all buried at Fair Hill Cemetery. At 72 years of age, Anna's now left all alone. She's the last surviving member of her immediate family, and she is left with 
five million dollars. Imagine being left in 1894 with five million dollars. A female, she was determined to very quietly give all the money away before she died. And she set out to do that. And I will talk about in subsequent slides exactly how she did that. Here's the piece of irony though. In 1898, Anna at age 76, I wonder, hmm, was she one of the first investors or was she an actually a member of the trustees of the Philadelphia Yearly Meeting of Friends Corporation, which was formed today, known as Friends Fiduciary. It's the organization that invests and administers, at that time, Quaker money, predominantly Hicksite money, but ultimately when they came back together, it was both Orthodox and uh, Hicksite money. But Anna's money was invested there. It still has the Friends Fiduciary still administers um, funds from Anna T. Jean's estate to this very day. Nevertheless, in spite of all these things, Anna found time in 1899 at age 77 to write a book of poetry, which she titled Fancy's Flight. There were only thought to be about 50 copies of this made, and it was just given to distant friends and relatives. Now, I've not seen a copy. I believe it's um, uh, religious poetry, and it is based on Zoroastrianism, and that is um, a Persian religion that she studied, and so she wrote poetry um, about religious um, thoughts that she had. Now, I'd also like to call uh, your attention to this historic Fairhill Burial Grounds, which is founded in 1703 by the um, Quakers. I mentioned it just briefly before. It is at 2901 Germantown Avenue in Philadelphia. It isn't uh, far away from Temple University Hospital. And Robert Purvis, who was the uh, focus of the February Northeast Philadelphia History Network's presentation, is buried there along with several other um, notable Quakers. So a great place to visit. I would highly encourage a visit there. Anna was a well-known patroness of the Philadelphia Zoological Society, the Philadelphia Academy of Fine Arts, and the Philadelphia Academy of Sciences. The Philadelphia Zoological Society, where she was a patron, was actually the first chartered zoo in the United States, but was not able to be completed until after the Civil War, and actually was six years after it was chartered. She did enjoy going there. In terms of the Philadelphia Academy of Fine Arts, her former painting teacher, Mr. Weber, often held exhibits there of his painting and his different artworks. Anna was a visitor there as well. She also frequented the Philadelphia Academy of Natural Sciences. In the mid-1870s, there was a newspaper article that talked about her donation of glass uh, samples of mollusks and snails and other invertebrates. They were they were glass samples because it was very difficult to keep and to study those animals when they were dried and desiccated. That was also in the article, um, an interesting piece of information, her one brother, I, I believe it might have been Joseph, donated two skulls of elephants that he had collected. I'm not quite sure we want to know how he got those skulls. Anna was aging. She had $5 million that she wished to spend very quietly before she passed away. Between the ages of 73 and 76, she established the Joseph Jeans Fund, and it was to help the establishment and maintenance of boarding homes for the aged and infirm amongst friends and those in sympathy with us. I point this out because the phrase, or portion of the phrase, amongst friends and those in sympathy with us was a phrase that you saw frequently throughout her 
uh, bequests in her codicil and in her will. She believed that the money was not only to be spent for Quakers, but for others as well. During this period of time, she gave funds to build nursing homes in Abington, Moorestown, Bucks, Concord, Haddonfield, Philadelphia, Salem, Burlington, and in Western homes. There is still money that is available for these homes. And not only the homes did she build, but she also gave money for infirmaries. So they have places where they could receive care while they were sick and at the nursing home. In 1897, at age 75, Anna and the Quaker, the Philadelphia Quaker meeting, built the 1708 Race Street home. Anna really wasn't very happy with it, even though that the Quaker meeting ra raised $11,970.50. This is courtesy of reviewing some of the Quaker records, um, plus the funds from Anna. She just really wasn't very happy with how this was going. So between 1903 and 1904, when she was between 82 and 83, she purchased four acres of land at the northeast corner of Green Street and Washington Lane. And then she proceeded to spend $200,000 and build this beautiful facility. And here is um, a April 4th, 1904 newspaper article from which I'm going to read. And she didn't want to hand over the money and have a committee in charge. So she did everything herself. She got the architects. She worked with the architectural planning. She did all the details. There's stories abound where she would walk the property with her measuring stick and her pencil and paper. And she would record if she found something, she would go and demand that it be fixed before they could move along. And she conferred with the workers. Everyone knew her. The building was 400 feet long four stories high, made of brick with blue marble trim. It had 75 living rooms, 20 bathrooms, a capacity for 55 guests. The north side was for men, the south for the women. It had a large dining room on the first floor, oak hardwood floors, tiled halls, and it was all to fireproof the structure. There was a cold storage plant in the basement. She much later gifted uh, funds for shrubs, flowers, and trees. I actually did see a tree that she had planted while she lived there. There's a little plaque that indicates that she had done this in um, probably 1904, 1905. And she later um, endowed $250,000, the income to be paid to the committee in charge of the home. And this was called Stapley Boarding Home, or also called Germantown Boarding Home. The picture on the left is of Stapley Boarding Home circa 1910, clearly a few years after Anna passed away. But nevertheless, it is a great picture of Stapley and it is a lovely facility. Uh, Anna lived there from when it opened on April 4th, 1904, until the end of her life. She rented two second floor rooms of the bath for $12 per week, and she promptly moved in. In addition, she prepaid several women's board until their death. Not only was she concerned about aging, but as she was continuing to age and being ill herself, she began to be concerned about not just infirmaries, but perhaps the need for a general hospital. The upper right hand picture is a photocopy of a note, an invitation that she sent to a dear close Quaker friend by the name of Charles Saunders. And she asked him to come and visit her in 1903 to talk about an infirmary that he was seeking funds for, for one of the boarding homes, and the possibility of building a general hospital. So, this is what happened. Charles came to visit her and talk about money for an infirmary at Norristown Friends Home. Later that day, she went and selected $25,000 in bonds to establish the infirmary, and the following day gave those funds to Charles. While there, and on later reflection, Charles believes that that's when Anna began to recognize the need for a general hospital or infirmary, particularly for cancerous 
nervous, and disabling ailments. It was at this time that Anna knew that she was not well and that she did have a type of cancer, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Not only was aging on Anna's mind, but education was too. In 1889, again, in honor of, of her sister, Mary, she sit, set up a loan fund, and it was basically to help people, particularly Quakers, attend uh, schools and get an education. And this was to be money that was a loan. It was not um, anything else and was to be without interest, and to be returned by the people who received it as soon as they were able. In fact, there's a story that talks about how um, interested she was in education, that she would review the loan funds and actually found an error in one of the, um, the funds that was granted and promptly wrote out a check for $2,000 and had that money replaced in the appropriate place where it belonged so that more people could get the money as they needed for their education. She also founded the Samuel Jeans Fund for educational purposes in um, 1895. And what's of interest that there is that it helped publish the Hicksite Quakers periodical, Friends Intelligencer, till 1955. In 1900, Anna was 78, and the Women's Hospital of Philadelphia received ex extensive amounts of funds from her siblings in honor of her siblings. Now, Women's Hospital of Philadelphia was part of the Women's Medical College of Philadelphia, both places of which had received extensive genes funding. They built clinic halls, they built uh, laboratories, there was endowment funds in perpetuity, there were funds for soldiers and others that could be tapped. And the one that um, most dear to my heart, is being a, being a nurse and an educator, is that in Samuel Jean's name, there was a permanent fund for instruction and practical training of women nurses. And this was a very important thing because while much of this money was spent and donated and used for education at the time, it is so unfortunate that now these places are no longer in existence. But nevertheless, the genes were actively involved in the education of males, females, blacks, whites. Education continued to be on Anna's mind. Many wealthy philanthropists were active in charitable giving for education, and a gentleman by the name of George Peabody suggested that Booker T. Washington of Tuskegee Institute, now Tuskegee University, and Howard Burke Frizzle from Hampton Institute, now Hampton University, were encouraged to approach Anna about funding education initiatives in the South. She came or she, they went to visit her, rather, and each came away after their visit with $100,000 for their respective um, institutions. Well, to follow up on that, Anna decided to give $200,000 to the General Education Board for Southern Rural Projects, like dormitories at the institutes and universities and other sorts of things. And this funding to the General Education Board in 1905, when Anna was 83, was facilitated by Booker T. Washington and Howard Burke Frizzle. In 1907, at age 85, Anna made the most incredible generous request, bequest, excuse me, she decided to prepay an endowment fund for $1 million. And it was for community, country, and rural schools for colored people in the southern United States. The trustees of this money were to be Booker T. Washington and Hollis Burke Frizzle. There were stipulations, however, they had to travel to Philadelphia to receive the check personally from Anna. They also had to immediately incorporate 
with an integrated board. The board was black and white men. Taft was on there. Uh, Peabody was on. There were all sorts of very powerful and politically well-connected people, Quaker and non-Quaker, black and white, all of whom were approved by Anna. And it was called the Rural Negro School or Jeans Fund at much later. And I'd like to say that um, it's been just a few moments to talk about what actually happened with this money. In 1908, a after Anna had passed away, um, the first Jean supervisor was hired. Her name was uh, Virginia Estelle Randolph. She was a black woman from Henrico County, Virginia. She developed what was called the Henrico Plan, and it became the model throughout the United States. Um, it combined academics with industrial training, fundraising, and a need for well-maintained school buildings. The Jean's supervisors provided for basic and advanced education of predominantly female, but there were some male teachers. And between 1907 and, 60, and 1968, they published culturally appropriate primers. They did research. They raised money for construction of Rosenwald schools. Um, it was The model was shared internationally. Um, and work was done by these teachers with the organizers of the NAACP. And they overturned the school segregation in Brown v. the Board of Education of Topeka in 1954. What amazed me when I was doing my research, in 2015, using economic modeling techniques, a gentleman by the name of Dr. Chrisman, an economist at Georgia State University, determined that the gene supervisors closed the black-white literacy gap by up to 5%. That was a phenomenal change in the literacy gap during the period of time. The Southern Education Foundation, which is a later... Um, version of the General Education Fund is still in existence today. And Anna and the Gene Supervisors are very well known and honored throughout the Southern United States. <laughs> Quakers at the time were some of the dominant forces for the development of beneficial or charitable organizations. Writers have suggested that great numbers and varieties of voluntary organizations filled an institutional and power vacuum and functioned as an integrating force in America at that time. Often sponsored by wealthy and religious based, Anna was no different in wanting to pay it forward for vulnerable and disenfranchised populations. As part of her last will and codicil of 1907, she chose to to provide $3,000 each for six soup kitchens and four day nurseries, all within the area in which she resided in, at Stapley uh, Boarding Home. She also provided $5,000 each for eight charity homes, <clears throat> excuse me, for destitute white, black, lame, male, female, adults, and children. She also provided for the F Fireman's Pension Fund of Philadelphia and, excuse me, she did that because she was deeply concerned about children who had been left with no father, husbands that had been maimed and injured or died, and wives who just simply had, had no help. She had two societies for prevention of cruelty that she funded. She gave money for both the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to the Children and cruelty to animals. She also provided funds for the Sanatorium Association of Philadelphia, which was located in Red Bank, New Jersey. It was a summer camp, actually, for children with tuberculosis. Anna was always deeply concerned of those less fortunate, more vulnerable, and disenfranchised. Anna was deeply concerned about compassionate care for the sick. That's evidenced by the money that she gave as part of her work with aging and building the nursing homes or boarding homes as they were called then and the infirmaries. Anna also gave money as part of her will to build a hospital, a provision of her will dated February 25th, 1907 reads, item 
I give and bequeath the sum of $200,000 and my residuary estate to the incorporated trustees of the Philadelphia Yearly Meeting of Friends, of which I am a member, the said gift and bequest to be devoted to the establishment and endowment of a general hospital or infirmary for cancerous, nervous, and disabling ailments, the said institution to be under the charge of a joint committee of co quarterly meeting homes for aged and infirm friends and those in sympathy with us. To the left is the 1700s etching of Stapley Manor. Remember when I had said to you that earlier in the 1700s, a Jean's family had come over and they had a huge tract of land in what was then called Moorland. This, however, over the years had been sold off and in 1845, two of the brothers bought uh, the 20, 200 acres. This mansion here, or Stapley Manor as it was called, was what they also called a farmhouse and that is what it looked like it was large it was ornate and it was fairly well furnished now stop for just a moment at the same time as this uh, property was coming up and was being used to build a hospital Swarthmore College had also requested received a bequest from Anna. It was declined due to a stipulation that all sorts of sports be abandoned. The funds therefore remained in her residuary estate. And in 1920, a private sale and purchase of Stapley Farms was approved. In 1923, when they clearing up and cleaning up the land, they found an actual large farm, uh, mansion on the grounds, not this farmhouse. They thrifty Quakers used stones from the mansion to build the hosp the first hospital, and they used the foundation of the old mansion to build Stapley Hall boarding home. They also dug a quarry on the property to obtain stones for the new buildings. Begun in 19, the building began in 1926. And this came from uh, selected facts concerning the history of Jean's Hospital as gleaned from the official minutes in 1913 to 1964. It also serves to note that Charles Saunders was not only on the committee that um, helped decide what the hospital would look like and was actually part of the first charter, he was also on their first board of trustees. So he was a very influential man. The hospital was actually opened in 1928 and what you see on the right is a side view of Jean's Hospital. It was actually completed 21 years after Anna's death. Another interesting piece of information, there were actually distant members of the family who sued for money from the residuary estate, but the court upheld Anna's will and they did not receive any additional funding or any additional money as they had requested. Again, just to give some context, then here's a 1930 aerial view of Jean's Hospital on the left. You can see it's a very rural area, and there was actually uh, a lot of concern expressed by physicians and, and other notables that this would not be a good uh, place to build a hospital. Nonetheless, the Quakers did persevere, and they have, the Quakers had connections with people all throughout the center city Philadelphia area. Then to the right, you'll also notice that this is a 2022 aerial view of Temple Jeans, Temple University Jeans campus, I stand corrected, uh, today, which is the Jeans Hospital and the Fox Chase Cancer Center are both part of the Temple University health system. You can see from both pictures that there was proximity to not only Fox Chase, but accessibility to the streetcar trolley, a major bus line, and a train made this a very ideal place for a hospital. Anna was 85 when she died September 24, 1907 at Stapley Boarding Home. The cause of death, carcinoma scrofulous of the breast. A 1907 newspaper article described the colored women who came to pay their respects and crowded the doors of the parlor at the boarding home. They burst into Anna's favorite songs, Safe in the Arms of Jesus, How Tedious and Tasteless the Hours, or December is as Pleasant as May, and Praise God from Whom All Blessings Flow. 
a select few friends and extended family members were sitting at the wake and were informed that the will be read after she was cremated and buried at Fairhill Cemetery with her siblings. She left money for the upkeep at Fairhill Cemetery in perpetuity and also created a cremation fund, which is still available today. The picture you see in the center there was painted originally posthumously by Esther Heacock, a resident at Stapley Boarding Home. Of interest, though, the painting of Anna that's hung at Temple University Hospital Jean's campus was purchased by the Ladies Auxiliary in 1936. It was painted from a photo taken of the original hung at Stapley Boarding Home, which I have seen. It was painted by Isabel Branson Cartwright, a member of a group of female artists named the Philadelphia Ten. Let's listen to the songs that Anna's family and distant relatives friends would have heard. legacy. Anna T. Jeans was born into a wealthy Philadelphia Quaker family, one of ten children. Single, she never married. The tiny woman was left the sole surviving member of her immediate family. She carefully and wisely invested with a vision that spoke to her Quaker values and vast understanding of and commitment to activities to lessen human suffering in a changing America. Her philanthropic work focused on the broad areas of aging, compassionate care of the sick, education, vulnerable and disenfranchised populations. Her commitment lives on today, embodied by her phrase, adopted as the motto of the Jean's teachers, the next needed thing, yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And this was adapted from content of, from an article that a dear colleague and friend of mine, Ellie Reinhardt and I published in Friends Journal, it also came, some of the content came from uh, the application for the historical marker that was obtained in 2019 for Anna, which is on Central Avenue near Temple University Jean's campus. And that's in the upper left corner. And then on the bottom left corner is um, a relatively recent marker as well. That was from Fairhope, Alabama, April 2021 and it was celebrating the Anna T. Jeans School. So a much loved woman in both the North and the South. Thank you so very much for listening to my presentation about Anna Thomas Jeans' life and legacy of philanthropy. There is so much more I could say, so much more I could share, but that information is best left for another day. Please remember the trustees of Philadelphia Yearly Meeting, a Friends Corporation, for, formed in 1898, continues to administer fun, funds from Anna T. Jeans estate 200 years later. Happy almost birthday, Anna. Bye-bye. References are available upon request. <laughs>